What I'm going to do is uh, first uh, tell a few stories, uh, and then I'm going to go back and look at Revelation, the first four chapters. So if you have your Bibles handy, or if you have your some electronic device Bibles, I'll assume you're not checking the internet, you're actually reading your Bibles, uh, follow that a little bit. But I've spent uh, a month or so going back and reading those first chapters and imagining what it was like to get a letter uh, from a church in Asia about your faithfulness or faithlessness, and then to begin to think about that today. What does it mean for us to get letters from Asia uh, as opposed to sending letters to Asia? Because it's going a different direction now. And what would Asians be saying to us today if they were to send letters? So uh, first, a couple stories. The first story is uh, from my time as a pastor in Singapore. I pastored church for three years, and I would tell uh, people, don't tell the principal or the dean this, but when I was in Singapore, I had to teach four courses a semester. Here it's like two or one, okay? And at the same time, I was pastoring a church that had 400 in attendance on a Sunday, and while I was pastoring it, they planted two new churches. So that's a full-time job right there, but then I was also teaching all these courses. They expect you to do a lot because there just aren't enough people to do the work. Uh, it's not that I was that valuable. They just couldn't find anybody else. So the first story is about my pastoral ministry. Two of the most vivid memories I have of pastoral ministry in Singapore were weddings and baptisms. Catholics might say two sacraments, but I would say one and a half sacraments. I consider uh, marriage a half a sacrament. Marriage is so closely tied to Jesus and the church and ordination, it really is almost a sacrament. It certainly is a sacramentum or a mystery. After 37 years, it's still a mystery to me. I will talk about weddings later, but here I want to talk about baptisms. Although I did baptize a few babies, now this was a Presbyterian church, okay? I only baptized a few babies and I dedicated a few to the triune God. Most of my baptisms were of young people between the ages of 15 and 25, about 70 or 80 of them in two and a half years of ministry. Generally, probably like a lot of your churches here, right? Generally, it was 10 or 15 people at a time. About half of them were in national service because national service in Singapore is required. Think about this, two and a half years of every young man's life a crew cut, daily training, two and a half years. What it does is it, it helps the, uh, the men to catch up to the women. The women are already quite mature and ready to go. So it holds the men back a little bit and kind of gets them disciplined. About half of them are national service with their hair looking like black, newly shorn lawns, all of them. I had met with each one of them just one time and the other seven meetings they met eight times before they were baptized. Fairly intensive discipling sessions were done by one or two of the preachers who worked with me. I usually didn't know their names. I usually felt guilty for not knowing their names as I looked at them. I thought, my gosh, I'm baptizing this young man. I don't have a clue what his name is. The church administrator would walk with me and an elder would walk behind me, one holding out the cheat sheet for me to look at to learn all the people's names as I was announcing them, the other with the sacred water and a Tupperware bowl. Profane things made sacred. Each adolescent was on his or her knees. They would kneel down in a row, 15 or 20. Following my lead, each one would renounce Satan and all his wiles and then confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They always wanted to make sure it was a real baptism <laughs> because they had so many Baptists there, so they wanted to make sure you use enough water, okay? Uh, we don't want the Baptists to think we're minimizing something so important, they said. And so with three overflowing handfuls, I drenched those black-haired crowns. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The water tumbled down the white blouses of the young ladies, but the hair of the young men standing up at attention, held the water like dutiful soldiers until they bowed down. Kneeling, renouncing, confessing, and then being washed and sent out. Sent out into the world. It's a simple but profound drama. 
A drama that, I will argue, transforms lives, reconciles people, redeems the lost, and can even overturn dictatorships. In short, it can change the world. Kneeling, renouncing, confessing, being washed, and sent out. What I've just described is typical of the global movement of Christianity in certain regions, only certain regions, not every region. Like the earliest churches in Asia, Jesus says both, I know your deeds, and yet I hold this against you. As the early church was to learn from the comfort and the judgment from Jesus, so we can learn something today by being attentive to the work of the Spirit of God in Asian churches. Footnote, I had written this about Asian churches and all of a sudden I thought of my good friend Ogbu Kalu who passed away a few years ago. And uh, he and Lamansani and others remind us that the real miracle is the African churches. So there's one African church here for those of you looking for something on Africa. My second story. About two years ago, I was riding the number one red line subway from the Upper West Side near Columbia University to Times Square. Apparently, a young man from Africa got on just a stop or two before me in Harlem. For the whole ride, some 70 blocks, the young man with Bible opened pleaded for the silent subway riders to repent of their sins and give their lives to Jesus Christ. I was deeply moved, if not a little uncomfortable. But I was also strangely, strangely convicted. I felt that I needed to confess my own sins, mostly sins of complicity and lukewarmness. And at the same time, I wanted to stand up and say something like, are African brothers correct? Listen to him. I just sort of wanted to kind of affirm him. But instead, I sat quietly and respectfully, sensing that I was in a holy presence on a New York subway heading to Midtown. It seemed that multicult the multicultural mix of singles and couples of families going about their mundane routines were also aware of something special. No one shouted at him to be quiet. Everyone seemed respectful of the pleading prophet on the subway. Providentially, we alighted at the same stop at Midtown. He gathered his things, got down on the ground, gathered his things in his bag before going up the steps. And I used that brief hesitation that he had in his otherwise very intentional and intense day to log in with the prophet. Where are you from? Nigeria. Thanks for your lovely words. I will pray for you. Here. I handed him a 20 and then I ran up the steps. I didn't know what else to say. Observation. Christianity is not what we once knew it to be. The religion of the West, which was brought by missionaries to non-white people and some of them converting, becoming more Western in culture as it came. We could live this lie until a generation ago, but we can't live that lie any longer. The assumption of Western Christian priority or normativity makes no sense anymore. It does not explain the facts, and it is just one more lingering shadow of Western imperialism. Christianity is not a Western religion, and Western normativity is a dangerous myth. No culture, no society has monopoly on the gospel, either its theology or its practice. And yet, there is such a thing as Christian theology and practice, which is opposed to practices and beliefs that are not Christian. More on this later. The way most of us do church, built around weekly worship, at least for me, and committee meetings, and maybe a couple suppers, is not the way most of the people in the non-Western world do church. The rapidly growing churches in Asia, Africa, Latin America, Pacific, and elsewhere are not distinctively Pentecostal or low church, nor are they distinctively high church or hierarchical. The non-Western churches are hard for us to grasp because like the Holy Spirit or the Tao, they just cannot be grasped by our Western assumptions. Most non-Western churches live in a world more like that of the world of Jesus or Paul and less like the world of the Enlightenment or postmodernism, even though they live comfortably with our world. 
They have absorbed the products and benefits of the Enlightenment with world without becoming Enlightenment Christians. Now, that's very hard for us to understand because in some ways they're using this technology much better than we are. I mean, in Singapore, well, I went to teach in Kota Kinabalu. That used to be called North Borneo. And I asked students to bring out their Bibles, and two-thirds of them brought out, you know, some little electronic device. And uh, I thought, that's more than in Pittsburgh. So, you know, the technology, all the Enlightenment benefits, hey, they're into that. But they have not accepted our Enlightenment assumptions about how to think about Christianity. In these brief talks, I would like to, us to rediscover something of the nature of Christian faith by listening to Christians from Asia, as it were, receiving letters from our brothers and sisters in Asia and some from Africa. I would like you to think of this as a rediscovery less than as an emergence. Think of recovery more than progression. The reason I say that is because Andrew Walls, when he went to Ghana, uh, he was having the hardest time understanding Christianity in Ghana. And his problem was he thought he was looking at 20th century Christianity. And he said, no, I'm not really observing 20th century Christianity. Most of these people have been Christian for a generation or two. I'm looking at second century Christianity. And so in receiving some letters from overseas, it's less sort of a progression with us or an emergence with us than it is for us to look back at a recovery of something that is a part or essential to our faith. Remembering the church, the seven churches of Asia, this little talk here is dealing with just the first four chapters of Revelation. And if you remember those first four chapters, one and four deal with issues of worship in Jesus Christ, and two and three deal with specific churches. So if you don't have your Bible hand, uh, handy, maybe that will help remind you of it. I will introduce some of these themes of Asian Christianity today by looking back at some comments about the earliest Asian churches found in Revelation. Most of these churches, even if they were made up of urban elites today in Shanghai or Tokyo or Singapore, these people in Asia are living very close to the Bible. Their lives are being conformed to the Bible. By the way, 65,000 Bibles have been printed in China. Uh, that it's not incidental that also Christianity is growing very rapidly in China. There is a 1,900-year gap between the book of Revelation and Asian churches there and Christians in Asia today, and there's a 5,000-mile difference in distance between the two, between Revelation churches and East Asia today. And yet, I think we'll see there is some amazing continuity as followers of Christ in Asia. What do we learn about early Asian churches from Revelation? First, and this comes from just kind of pouring through, uh, ch especially chapters 2 and 3. The message given to the seven churches of Asia was focused absolutely on Jesus as the word, ruler, and victor. I choose those three uh, because they come right out of the text. Focused on Jesus as the word, the ruler, and the victor. The first chapter sets the tone for the message to the seven churches. John receives the revelations, the various ones, vision, with a vision and a voice in the midst of worship. This is worship experienced where a word is given to each of these churches about their faithfulness and their faithless deeds. The vision John has is of Jesus in his glory both in chapter 1 and 4. In fact, the word to seven churches is framed by John's vision of Christ standing before him during worship in chapter 1, and then Jesus sitting on the throne, ruling, uh, surrounded by worshiping elders and creatures in chapter 4. In both instances, Jesus is depicted in power, glory, mystery, and beauty. To understand how much the message and vision is centered on Jesus Christ, we should note that the message delivered to each church is given from Jesus. Listen to a few of these addresses. And it just comes back again and again. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. These are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. These are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like a blazing fire and whose feet 
like burnished bronze. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. These are the words of him who is holy and true and holds the key of David. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the rule, ruler of God's creation. You can't get away from it, can you? Secondly, the earliest Asian churches were being called to live into their Lord. Because of the centrality of Jesus Christ and his words and his teaching, what they're being called to is living into, that's the way I like to look at living into their Lord, his teachings and his deeds. Their deeds and teachings were carefully scrutinized. Truth mattered, and so did actions that were congruent with that truth. It's really impossible to separate the thought from the deed, the teaching from the morality in these prophetic statements. The only reason you would separate them is because you're basically an enlightenment thinker and you're constantly dichotomizing. But if you just read it, take it as the way they, they are, you can't separate them. In six of the churches, the angel gives the message, I know your deeds, followed by details of good or, and at times also, bad practices, beliefs, and teachings. So when it talks about deeds, it includes, when it talks about well, I, I know your deeds, it talks about beliefs and teachings. There's no dichotomy. Belief was revealed in deeds, and deeds were a type of truth claim. I know what you believe because I see how you live. Heresy, we might say, could be seen on film. Here is how it's expressed in the words of the church of Ephesus. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. So I know your deeds and that you understand false claims. And so deeds and word and truth are all woven together. So the earliest Asian church was being called to live into their Lord. Thirdly, the earliest Asian churches struggled with cultural compromises. If we were to summarize the basic problems with these early Asian churches, we would have to use phrases like cultural compromise or losing their distinctiveness or following the neighbor rather than the Lord. How did they compromise? They forsook their first love and devotion. That's 2.4. They followed cultural teachings and practices, 2.14 and following. Even while many were faithful under persecution, 2, 13, and 14. Common practices that were most offensive to Jesus were Gnostic teachings, 2, 24, sexual immorality, 2, 14, 20, and 22, and food sacrificed for idols, same verses. These are among the most egregious compromises calling for the strongest words from the angels. When we think of the word of the Lord to the seven churches, we usually think of their impiety rather than their piety. I, mean, I remember many times quoting, I will spew you from my mouth because you're lukewarm kind of thing. What they were lacking rather than what they offered. What these churches lacked related to their misunderstanding of chapters 1 and 4, where Christ is seen in glory. If they had really been captivated by such a vision and a voice that what we read about in chapter 1, it would certainly have been hard to compromise and take your eyes off of Jesus. But slipping away from the first love glancing away from Jesus' face, listening to other teachings, looking at the lives, and then beginning to lust after others, slowly they began to be pulled away. But note that it was not the whole church in any region which was swept away. Just like Asian churches or just like our churches today, there were some who painfully endured afflictions and poverty, 2.9 and 2.13, while others were living lives of vice, avarice, and immorality, 2, 9, and 14. They're right there together. Sounds just like our churches. And some still had the good old reputation of faithfulness in life, but they had become dead, 3, 1. And we often forget the church in Philadelphia looks pretty good in the midst of all these cultural compromises. You have kept my word and not denied my name. You have kept my command to endure patiently. Kept my word, kept my command means you're following it. You're actually doing it. 
I believe there's a threefold emphasis upon abiding in Jesus' teaching here, harking back to John 15. The Philadelphians, of whom I have a particular affinity, kept his word, it says. They did not deny his name, and they kept his command. Keeping Jesus' commands is a way of expressing their deeds. A word used seven times in the first three chapters, keeping my deeds. Keeping commands means you're living into the doctrine. Doctrine is not just knowledge, but it's belief, it's faith, it's trust. It's a way to order your life. That's what doctrine is. Doctrine leads to doxology, which overflows into deeds. This is how we can look at the message given to, J to John by the messenger of Jesus Christ to the early churches in Asia. Doctrine leads to doxology, which overflows into deeds. Before looking at some of the Asian churches today, I'd like to remind us why the Asian churches are important today. Who cares? Well, I do. That's, my <laughs> that's what I write about. But you should care. This involves looking at global Christianity as a movement, a movement that does not just move forward or advance like a constantly rising tide, to mix my metaphors. It does not just continuously multiply like rabbits on the outback. The Christian movement is a movement of the Holy Spirit of the triune God. Therefore, we can expect there to be some congruence between God's ways and the ways of the kingdom on earth. These themes or traits we will look at later, but here, we simply want to ask, what has happened in the past century? Or even more dramatically, what has happened the past 50 years regarding Christianity globally? Major transitions in Christianity that have taken place in the last, last 50 years. And I, I, can't, I will not be able to express clearly enough how dramatic the shift has been. Uh, when I was in seminary, uh, we were still following sort of latterette, sort of tidal advance and recession as, as sort of a pattern of what was happening in the world. And it was still very much tied to uh, missionary outreach. Uh, nobody dreamed uh, what would happen in China uh, e even 25 years ago. Nobody dreamed that. Nobody dreamed what happened, happened in Africa uh, after uh, decolonialization, after the, the empires left. No, nobody dreamed. Matter of fact, most Americans still don't know. Uh, would happen. Certain, certainly the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury is trying to figure it out. So it's just unbelievable uh, what has happened, and it hasn't happened from the West, but it has happened because of mission from the West. Christianity in the last 50 years, globally considered, has had its greatest transformation than ever before in 2,000 year history. I can say that because I have finally finished a uh, two-volume history of Christianity in 2,000 years. There's nothing like it. I've studied Christianity on every continent uh, in every century. It was real easy to study Christianity in North America in the second century. There wasn't much going on. But when you get into the 18th and 19th century, there's a lot going on. And I've studied it for the last 12 or 15 years. And this last 50 years, nothing like it has ever happened in 2,000 years. If we were sitting here, when Pittsburgh Theological Seminary was first built or reestablished here at 616 North Highland Avenue, there would be an extreme optimism, this is back in 58, an extreme optimism about the growth of the church, the remarkable unity that was taking place with the recently founded World Council of Churches, and the reunited Presbyterian churches here in North America, the thousands of building programs and local churches that were taking place in the 50s and early 60s and this beautiful new campus with new worship space in Pittsburgh. Two denominations came together, the two seminaries dissolved, we came together. There was nothing but optimism at that time of what was going to happen in Christianity in the West. Christianity in China was lost, or so we thought, in 1960, as it was in Russia. We've been uh, weeping over that for about a half a century. But there was new post-war optimism in the West and some hope for Africa. Everyone knew that Christianity was a European and North American religion. Everyone knew that Christianity belonged in the West and was struggling to be exported to Africa and Asia. That was the way we thought. That's the way I was raised. Today we know that Christianity from its inception was an Asian religion that happened to spread in the first generation to Africa and parts of Europe. 
It just happened to be excluded from much of the world, much of Africa and Asia, by political considerations for a millennium. But now it is recovering its global nature. If we back up to 1910, we find that 93% of the Christians in the world were found in Europe and the Americas. 93% in Europe and the Americas. That includes Latin America. 66.3% of the Christians in the world were found in Europe. So if you said Euro Christianity is a European religion, well, yeah, it basically is, was. Just two years ago, the Pew Foundation estimated that less than 25% of the Christians were found in Europe today. That's huge. Remember, less than 10% of Christians lived in the non-Western world, the Eurocentric world. Christianity was really bound to European civilization. Today, 67% of the Christians in the world, 67% live outside of Europe and North America. In other words, your average Christian is an African woman in West Africa today. When I was in seminary in the 1980s, we heard that soon there will be a 50-50 split between Christians in the West and in the non-Western world. And today it's 67%. I'm not that old. <laughs> the 1980s was not that long ago. I mean, can you imagine that? From the 1980s to today, we were looking towards a 50-50 split. And now 67%, over two-thirds of the Christians, live outside the West. Even in 1990, we did not dream the shift would be so sudden and dramatic. Christian vitality and growth is not found in the West, either in our traditional churches or in our missional churches, or I believe in our emergent churches. These are movements that are struggling to keep Christianity alive and find ways of moving forward. Real vitality and growth is found in Vietnam, in China, Nigeria, Nepal, and other places we never would have suspected. Most Anglicans attend worship in Nigeria, or more Anglicans worship in Nigeria than all of Europe and North America. More people attend church in communist China each Sunday than all of Western Europe. Did you hear that? More Christians attend worship in China than in all of Western Europe each Sunday. I'm not making this up. All right. Secondly, the erosion of the Christian West, of Christian faith in the West. And this is something, you know, this is, I think, what, one of the reasons we're here, is we want to take a look at how can we make sure we're not complicit in just flowing down the stream? And what does it mean to fight the good fight in this new cultural context? This erosion of Christian communities begun in the 18th century with the Enlightenment finally dealt, was dealt a mortal wound to Western Christianity in the 20th century, or nearly mortal, we're not dead. Christianity has slowly been eroded by Enlightenment reason and values. This can be measured in the way Christian colleges and universities have moved from being confessional to being broadly Christian to being described as having a Christian heritage to being a liberal arts college with a religion department. A small Presbyterian college in West Virginia, we're all thinking, aren't we, has had no professor of Christian studies or even a religion professor for over 10 years. And that college was founded by Presbyterians to make sure the faith would continue. The chaplain has resisted Christian groups on campus, and she is now gone. This is a pattern which shows how Western culture has redirected Christianity for generations. Today we find that fewer than 10% of the people attend church in most European countries. I tell my good friend Andrew Purvis, it's only 3 to 5% in Scotland. He would yell at me until he went back to worship a couple years ago, and he came back grieving because, uh, he, though he'd visited a lot, uh, it is remarkable. And according to a 2003 Harris poll, only 26% of Americans attend church each week. Uh, the University of Michigan, I think, has done the best study of that because if you ask people if they attend church each week, most people think very well of themselves. Oh, yeah, I attend church every week. But if you go on Monday morning or Monday afternoon and say, what did you do yesterday morning, <laughs> uh, or Sunday morning, or did you go to church this weekend? Well, not this weekend. Well, the numbers drop down by 50%. So it's, it's really uh, under 
Even very Catholic Spain can claim to only have about 17% weekly church attendance, and that's where the real vitality of the Roman Catholic Church was uh, during the Catholic Reformation period. Christian faith is eroding in the West with some few exceptions. Thirdly, in most places of the non-Western world, Christianity benefited from the end of colonialism. I was taught in grad, in grad school that um, uh, missionary work came on the coattails of colonialism. And therefore, the reason for the expansion of Christianity in the world was the, 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 this nice unholy alliance between imperialism and Christian missions. It's a very complex story. That is part of the story but that's not most of the story. The erosion, or excuse me, um, even though the end of colonialism meant the end of protection for missionaries in Asian countries, Christianity thrived in the non-Western world after colonialism was dismantled. Africa is the most remarkable change and the most clear evidence that colonialism restrained, constrained, prevented Christian growth. In 1910, Africa, in Africa, 1910, there were only 9 million Christians, and, in, and at the same time, 34 million Muslims, about a 1 to 4 ratio of Christians to Muslims. The 1910 Edinburgh Missionary Conference didn't even talk about Africa because they assumed Africa was going to be Muslim. In 1910, our confident uh, uh, Western Christians had pretty much given up on Africa. The 1910 Edinburgh Conference, Africa's not discussed. There's possibly one African delegate at the 1910 Edinburgh Missionary Conference, but he wasn't listed in the delegates, but he was interviewed at a newspaper, so he may have been studying in England or at the time or Scotland and attended the conference. So Africa, they, they kind of gave up. There were four times as many Muslims as Christians there, and after 80 years or so of Protestant missionary work, not much was happening. In 1965, in the middle of decolonialization, or towards the end of it actually, the ratio changed dramatically to one to two. 60 million Christians, about 140 million Muslims. Today there's about a one to one ratio of Christians to Muslims in Africa, with Christianity holding a slight majority. 360 million Christians to 317 million Muslims. Africa, it was thought, would be a Muslim continent. It's not going to be a Christian continent or a Muslim continent, but it's going to have a lot of vital Christianity there. There are many causes for the rapid growth of Christianity in the non-Western world, but among the central causes is that Christianity became a local indigenous religion. It took on local dress. It danced a local dance. It sang local songs. Supported from outside, as an outside religion, its growth was truncated and anemic. Fuller Nigerian and Kenyan Christianity thrived in one of its ancient homes, Africa. In Asia, Christianity grew from 2.5 to 9% of the population from 1910 to 2010, most of the growth occurring during the last three decades, again, after the end of the empires, of the Western empires. Such growth, along with the massive populations of Asia, meant that numerically Asians were more active as Christians than our Europeans and Americans. Because 9% of you know, 2 billion is a lot. I'm not a math major. My, my son is an accountant. He'll figure it out for us. Four, mixed results at the end of the collapse of atheistic communism. This is really interesting. The end of communism in Europe was marked by a continued period of Christian doldrums. The end of communism in East Asia was marked by the most remarkable growth of the church in Asia since second and third century Persia. Uh, most of us don't know this, but I'll let you in on the secret. Christianity was growing more rapidly in Persia in the second and third centuries than it was in Europe. It just received much greater persecution by Zoroastrians and then later by Arabs. And, uh, but it was vitally growing. That's what I did my dissertation on, so I'm very familiar with this. And there has not been this kind of rapid growth in Asia since the second and third century. After 150 years of Protestant missionary work in China, less than 2% of the Chinese were Christian. The growth was then met with 28 years of communist rule 
under Chairman Mao, and then a slow relaxing of persecution and restrictions today. Today, after about 60 years of communist rule in China, Christianity is estimated to be the religion of about 100 million Chinese, or somewhere between 60 and 120 million. <laughs> We're not going to bicker over minor details like that, are we? It's very hard to count Chinese Christian noses. The growth is nothing short of remarkable. With no legal missionaries, I've met many illegal Korean missionaries there, and with minimal support, and much control by the national government. In short, Mao did more for Christian growth in 150 years of colonialism and Christian mission working together. If ever there were an emergent church, it is a modern church in China. Um, just one, one quick note about this. Uh, John Burgess, who teaches here, just came back from Russia. And we compare notes about sort of post-communist Christianity and he said, well, what happened in China and you know, in Vietnam? Because in Russia, that's just not kind of happening. Well, and, and part of the, the, the issue is what Russia is re recovering, is trying to recover, is political Orthodox Christianity you know, working with the state. And so it's recovering a Christendom kind of thing that had been crushed, actually been crushed long before communism because the czars had removed you know, any, any kind of uh, bishops or official rule. Whereas China was pre-Christian. And so after this uh, sweeping away of all the grand traditions and so forth and the search for identity and this great suffering that they have, they found a greater identity with the suffering Christ uh, than they found with a uh, clear Confucian social order and Buddhism. But that's a whole uh, another thing we can answer some questions about that. What I'd like to do real quickly to, to illustrate this is I think I made a copy on the back of your handout, or on the, yeah, the back of your handout of it's, it's hard to see, but world distribution of Christian population. But if you just kind of stand back and look at it in general, you can see that Africa almost doesn't show up on the map of 1910. You know, you have to kind of look care carefully and say, oh, where is Africa? <laughs> is it there? And then you look on the bottom and you say, oh my gracious, it is huge. China, you can't even find on that map in the top. But then in the bottom, you can see China there. If you have your bifocals on, you can read it. And, uh, and then North America is bigger, but proportionally, you compare it to Latin America, you can see how Latin America has grown dramatically. This is all from the Pew Charitable Trust, from their uh, excellent studies that they do on religion uh, in the world. And uh, I know some of the people working, they do very good work in, uh, in pulling together some of these statistics. All right, what I'd like to do real quickly here uh, is Tell a few stories about uh, one country that I know very well. Oh, actually, I have some more statistics. Let me, let's do a few more statistics for you math majors. In, t in the year 2000, it was estimated that 16,000 Africans were being converted per day. 16,000 Africans were being converted per day. But in Europe and North America, about 4,300 people were leaving the church or dying. Now, that'll give you an idea of just the huge differences in what's going on in the world. Uh, looking even closer to home, right here in Pittsburgh, since I returned from Asia in 1995, what has happened? I just thought it was interesting to say, well, what kind of an impact have I had in Pittsburgh? Right. <laughs> it's not good. That's why they're getting rid of me. It just took a long time to figure it out. It was Sunquist causing all these problems. In 1995, Pittsburgh Presbytery had 167 churches with 54,000 members. And I remember at the second Presbytery meeting I came to, I could not believe it. They were uh, selling a church or combining churches. Well, where I came from, I had to meet in a hotel because we had no churches. And uh, it was a real problem finding property uh, for a church. 2011, the Presbytery used to have 167 churches. It now has, I think, 145. Vera, do you know that? Uh, is it? About right, okay. And that's including churches we planted, okay? So we've, we're planting churches. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then 35,000 members, where we used to have 54,000 members. So I, I really haven't had much of a positive influence here. This is a loss of 22 churches and 19,000 members since I moved to Pittsburgh. Looking at the PCUSA nationwide, membership has declined by close to 50%, about 45% since 
since I returned to the USA. So we're doing much better than the National Church. Um, enough bad news. Let's go ahead and take a look at Singapore. I lived in Singapore for eight years. I taught at seminary, pastored a church, and preached at about eight to ten different denominations there. It's interesting. Once you get outside of the West, denominations make less difference. I have only preached in two non-Presbyterian churches in 17 years here, and I preached in many churches. Both of them were black churches. I think it's fascinating. In Singapore, uh, they didn't say, oh, you're Presbyterian, I can't invite you to my church. I preach at Pentecostal churches, Anglican, Methodist, Lutheran, Independent, you know, all kinds of churches. Um, I attended a couple Roman Catholic gatherings. I mean, there just wasn't that kind of identity by denomination. And uh, so anyway, my work was teaching at an ecumenical seminary, and so I had students from all different denominations and uh, did a lot of preaching. Well, Singapore has, is an interesting case study of Christian development in the last 50 years. After World War II, with the coming of independence, the church's leadership was dominated by foreign bishops and moderators. There's a great story that during the Japanese occupation, which was like two and a half or three years that Singapore was occupied by Japan, the, all the church leaders were put in prison at Changi Prison out near the airport uh, today. If you've ever been there, it's the nicest airport in the world, I think. And uh, out there by the, before the airport was built, they were put there in prison, and they looked around at each other. They were all European and North American. They said, my gosh, all of the bishops and moderators of the church in Singapore, as we're moving into the middle of the, of the 20th century, are still white. So they made a covenant that if they got out alive, they would start a seminary. And because it was a Lutheran, Methodist, and Presbyterian, they said, we'll call it Trinity Theological College. And they, they did. That's where I taught. But it was a commitment to turn back the church, to turn the church over to nationals. That, that uh, began to happen. So Trinity Theological College was founded. In reaction to that ecumenical school, a Bible college was founded, Singapore Bible College. Independence from Britain came in 63, and then independence from Malaysia in 65. They had race riots, reorganized the whole country by a young man at that time named Lee Kuan Yew, you've probably heard of. Uh, he became the prime minister. One well, of the first things he did, he saw the problem of ethnic violence and religious violence. And so he began to tear down all these kampongs, these villages, and move people into high-rise apartment buildings, forcing integration, we might say. Forced integration. Because the violence was developing in Muslim villages, or in Chinese villages, or Tamil villages. Well, now, in every building, there is all these high-rise apartments are built by the government, and you buy your flat there. Uh, but in each building will be reserved a certain number of flats for Chinese, for Malay, for Tamil, you know, mixed race, etc. So it's a very pluralistic society. Five languages, five major religions, four major ethnic groups, television in four major languages, which was great because our kids didn't watch much TV, so they didn't understand it. Christianity grew from about 2% of the population in 1965 to about 15% in the 70s and 80s, and today it's about 18.5% of the population. But 17% of the population, can you imagine this in Asia, claims no religion, purely secular. Now, uh, some of my pastor friends say usually what that means is they moved out of Taoism or Buddhism, or they moved out of Hinduism. They have a, an education now that where that religion doesn't make sense anymore. I didn't realize this, but a lot of Chinese religionists are a combination of Taoism and Buddhism and Confucianism. But what, li what rules their daily lives is superstition. It's, uh, you know, you make a decision about when to travel according to the zodiac. Uh, even the prime minister would. He wouldn't travel unless he went, uh, went to a Buddhist astrologer to determine it was a good time to travel. Uh, you have to have proper feng shui, where to put your furniture and so forth. Well, you go to school and university, and after a while, you realize this is crazy. You know, I want to build a house here, whatever. And so they have become secularized and stripped. So it's sort of like fulfilling Marx's uh, understanding of what's going to happen to religion. But many of them eventually will become Christian. And we forget this often in the West, but Jesus is really quite desirable. <laughs> if you have been reading the Jataka tales, the former lives of the Buddha, 
which are ahistorical. They take place in a mythological world and time. And then you read the life of Jesus and his care and concern for the poor, his very concrete you know, life inter interaction relationships. Um, I, was, I was shocked. I shouldn't have been, but I was shocked at how attractive Jesus is uh, for uh, secularists who've come out of another religion. And so many of those people will become religion, so become Christian, and so the faith is slowly growing. One of the determinants of faith in Singapore is the amount of education. The more education the person has, the greater the chance that they're Christian. Isn't that interesting? The more education. So close to 80% of the medical doctors and lawyers are Christian. Close to 80%, but only about 5% of the people cooking your fried rice in the wet market or the hawker stalls, only about 5 or 4% or of them are Christian. So the greater the exposure to education, the English language, and to Christianity, the greater the chance that you're Christian. Let me tell just two stories about people, and then I'll close and we'll go to lunch. Dr. Bobby Sung was a medical doctor who became a Christian while studying at the university. And that's where most of my young people that I baptized, it was coming through the university where they became a Christian. And they would wait until they got permission from their parents to be baptized. Uh, many of them would wait two, three, five years. I remember one wedding that I did, I was standing up front you know, with the groom, we're waiting for the parents to come. The father of the, of the groom had never been in church before. You know, he was a, a, a Buddhist temple kind of guy. And, uh, but he promised he would come to the wedding. But uh, in order to sort of assert his will, he came 20 minutes late. That's a long time to listen to organ music, you know. So I'm standing up there, and we're listening, we're looking, and says, is he going to come? Oh, don't worry, he'll come, he'll come. You know, how are we going to, you know. The organist said, I have another wedding in an hour, kind of thing. So we're kind of pushing this thing. So we said, okay, five minutes, he's going to come in five minutes, we're going to do it that. Then he walked in, he came in and sat in front, you know, crossed his arms. But they, they want to keep family together. So they wait until they get permission uh, from the family to get married, to get baptized. And sometimes it'll, it'll be years. They'll be Christian, but unbaptized Christians. So Bobby Sung was a medical student who became a Christian while studying, and uh, he looked for uh, some Bible study, and at that time there was still the, the student Christian movement was actively involved. But they were involved in that time in social uh, involvement in the, in the city, but they didn't have any Bible studies. And so what began at this time has been very influential for the leadership in all of Singapore and Malaysia was the uh, International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, IFES. Locally here, it's called InterVarsity. They began Bible studies, and, and Bobby Sung got involved with that. He finished medical school, was practicing medicine, began to train staff to work in the universities. And uh, they began to set up uh, Bible studies on every floor of every dorm in the medical school and the law school. At that time, until the government figured out what was happening, all of the medical students lived together. All of the law students lived together. And so Bobby strategized by setting up a Bible study on every floor of every dorm. Um, and consequently, uh, many of the doctors and lawyers came to faith over time. A couple of those who came to faith ended up working in the government, and Bobby convinced them not to split off and join other churches, but to stay faithful to their Anglican, Presbyterian, Methodist churches. And as a result, the faculty of Trinity Theological College were basically disciples of this one man, a medical doctor. He wrote the definitive history of Christianity in Singapore, Bobby Sung did. One of the reasons for the rapid growth of Christianity among the better educated was Bobby's strategy of starting Bible studies in university dorms. And one of the great lessons is most of the growth of Christianity in Asia, not just Singapore, comes from lay people. It's not pastors. It is such a powerful lay movement. The second story is one of our former students, Sunil Abhangabhitya. We just called him Sunil. Born into a Buddhist family in Sri Lanka. He was converted when in a university as a university student. He told this story here to our students one lunch, and when he was done telling the story, nobody said a thing. He said, I was lying down in my bed, and I looked up, and the roof opened up. And what came down were choirs of like angels. They all looked like Sri Lankans. And they were playing Sri Lankan instruments, these little horns and these little you know, violins and things. And they were singing songs in praise to Jesus. And I'd never seen anything like it before. He went back to university. A year later, 
a student gave him a little booklet, which was the Gospel of John, done by the Bible Society in Sri Lanka, and on the cover was a picture of heaven opened up uh, with Sri Lankan instruments, Sri Lankan angels singing these songs. It was a picture of heaven. And uh, so he asked about the book. He read it. He came to faith, you know, witnessed to his family. Fast forward, he felt called to ministry, so he went to New Zealand. He was very bright, so he wanted to go get a good Western education. And then he came to do his master's degree in Singapore. Uh, I was his advisor. After three days of orientation, he came into my office and said, uh, uh, Dr. Sundquist, um, uh, Solon and I are going to get married. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, no, you're not. I'm your advisor. You're not going to marry her. She was my, uh, my parishioner. Uh, she was from my church. So I said, what do you mean you're going to marry? No, we, we feel that God has called us to be married. I said, you've known each other three days. This can't be right. No, no, no. We're so, you know, they, they got married. I did the wedding. The next year, they got married. A Hokkien Chinese married a Sri Lankan former Buddhist Sinhalese. She spoke Hokkien, Mandarin, Malay, and English. He spoke uh, Sinhalese, some Tamil, and English. So they had English going for them. So they thought that what she needed to do if this marriage was going to work, they needed to drop out of seminary for a year, go back to Sri Lanka so she could learn Sinhalese. Just what she needed, another language, right? So she did. Got along well with his family. His family just loved her. Came back, finished school. Now what are they going to do? The church that I pastored finally built a building in Little India. All Chinese people. Now, you think that Americans have a corner on racism. My Chinese elder said, Dr. Sunquist, we cannot buy that property. Do you know where it is? I said, I know exactly where it is. I've walked around the property a number of times. It's in Little India. So? Well, what would it be like if my daughter's coming back from a fellowship meeting at night in that area? I said, I don't get your point. Well, they're Indians. <laughs> well, he left the church, but we built a church there. And then by God's grace, Sunil started a little Bible study with Sinhalese who are mostly working, changing bedpans in the hospital, cleaning homes, you know, very grunt kind of jobs uh, for the rich Singaporeans. About six years later, he had baptized 120 uh, Sinhalese, visiting in the hospitals and the nursing homes. And then what the church started to do, they got a vision for this. They would go back to Sri Lanka every summer. They would take a team of 10 or 20 people. They'd visit villages where these workers who had become Christian went back home. They'd go back and pray with them, encourage them, help them out, support them in mission. But the work in Sri Lanka was being done by Sri, by Sri Lankans who were briefly migrants in Singapore. That should give you some idea of the way the church is growing in Asia. Uh, most of these people are lay people, those people who are cleaning bedpans and you know, walk, mopping floors in nursing homes in Singapore and then go back to Sri Lanka. Uh, when we come back uh, tomorrow, we're going to be taking a look at some of the lessons from Singapore and then we're going to look at two other countries. And, uh, and then on Wednesday, we'll take a look at Africa and China, uh, two of the most dramatic places of change. Thank you.